Communion is uh, special to believers, and so we ask that if you don't claim Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, that you refrain from taking communion. It's not some empty ritual. The, the cracker and the juice represent the body and the blood of Jesus that was broken for us on the cross, poured out to cover our sins. So the Bible teaches us that as often as we take the cracker and the juice or the bread and the wine, we're proclaiming the death of Jesus until he comes, meaning we're saying we exist within the reality that was purchased by at the cross, the reality of God's forgiveness of our sins, of his pleasure in us and his acceptance of us because we are in Christ, because he died for us. So every time we take communion, we're thinking about what Jesus has done for us, and that's the, that is at the center of our reality as Christians. So it's very special to us. It's a time of remembering what he's done and, and coming back to him. Uh, so we'll get to do that as we respond to the gospel, one of our three RLG thing. Uh, we'll be doing that after the message. So John 14, a little bit of context. Um, Jesus is, uh, this is Passover time. Jesus just spoke or, or broke the bread and uh, passed around the wine and he instituted communion here and spoke with the disciples and told them uh, kind of what to expect. And this is the night that he's going to be betrayed. And it is this section of the Gospels and this section of human history, it's the darkest period in human history. The darkest point of his life, the darkest point of the life of the disciples, and the darkest point of, of human history. It's also going to be the point around which eternity pivots. This is the moment that we'll always look back on and praise God for this whole scene. So Jesus tells the disciples, one of you guys is going to betray me. Uh, the rest of you guys are going to run away and leave me in my hour of need. And then when Peter says, ah, no, nah, gee, that's not me, he says, Peter, you're not just going to leave me, you're going to deny me, not just once, but three times before the rooster crows tonight. It's, it's going down. All of you guys will fail me. So he tells them that, and Jesus knows he's going to be on the receiving end of all of this. We're establishing context for what we're about to read here. Jesus is going to be betrayed, denied, and abandoned by his closest friends. Have you ever experienced that? Being betrayed, being, having someone gossip about you or hurt you, whether to your face or behind your back. Jesus is going to go to Gethsemane after this, a garden, and he's going to get on his knees, fall on his face before the Lord, and beg him to let the cup of God's wrath pass from him. The cup that is intended to fall on Jesus' innocent shoulders in our place, to pay the price for our sin. It's going to be the worst suffering that could ever exist and it's going to fall on Jesus alone. And he goes to Gethsemane, and he gets on his knees, and he prays for the Lord to let this pass from him. Jesus doesn't deserve it. And what does God the Father say? Silence. Jesus doesn't hear anything. He, does, he, he says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Three times he goes back there. And each time, by the way, he comes back and sees that his best friends, the three disciples he chose to go with him, are asleep. They can't even stay awake to be moral support in this. So Jesus the Son of God has experienced what we, from our finite perspective, would call unanswered prayer. He's had to change his plan around God's plan, God the Father's plan. This is the old, have you ever experienced having what you consider to be an unanswered prayer, where God has a different plan? It will never compare with Jesus in Gethsemane. So he's, he's going to go through that soon. He's going to be so distressed and so weighed down by everything that he's sweating drops of blood. Then he's going to be betrayed, he's going to be arrested, he's going to be thrown into the political world and be in this corrupt system. He's going to be falsely accused, he's going to be um, misrepresented, misunderstood. How much we hate being misrepresented and misunderstood. How often we justify misrepresenting other people in gossip and complaining about them. But the, Jesus is going to be at the center of this. And unlike every other person in human history, Jesus is the one person who doesn't actually deserve it. He, he never said anything, he never misspoke, he never said a wrong thing in his life, and he's going to be misrepresented, misunderstood, and ultimately accused for a crime he didn't commit, and he's going to be treated as a criminal, beaten, whipped, spat upon, stripped, mocked, humiliated, he's going to be led up to Golgotha where he's going to be crucified, he's going to die a criminal's death, to be executed like a common criminal in an excruciating way, hands and feet nailed to the cross, 
it's, it's not pretty. And he knows that he's going to experience all this. And worse than all of that combined, he's going to take God's wrath for all of humanity on himself and experience that separation like none of us will ever have to experience in Christ. So knowing all of this, the worst moments of human history, what does Jesus do? Does he gather the disciples around and say, look, you guys, you're going to fail me. Shame on you. I am going through a really hard time. You just need to come around me. and You just need to serve me. Just a moment before the passage we're going to read, Jesus was on his hands and knees, hands and feet, washing the feet of his disciples. And, and right now, he's going to encourage the disciples, the same disciples who are going to fail him in his hour of need. This is Jesus. He takes on all of our suffering and never once stops thinking about us. It's always all for us. And it's also an example we can learn from. Do we throw pity parties when life's not going our way? Do we try and make ourselves up to look like a martyr or complain or gripe? And we think we're justified in it because darn it, life should be going better for me. Jesus is the only person who ever deserved to say that, and he didn't. This is what he said, John 14, 1. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas, one of the disciples, said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So everything we've just described, everything that he's going through, and the first thing he says here after, after telling uh, Peter that he's going to betray him and all the other bad news, he says, don't let your heart be troubled. So before we go any further, we can see He's speaking to his best friends who will fail him. They will, in the pivotal moment, how many of us pride ourselves in how we hold ourselves up to our standards? Look how good of a worker I am. Look how I always show up on time. Look how wise I am and, and how well I carry a conversation, how well I look. look like, we, just, we, pride, we have our own standards, our own like, personal morality or ethics. And the disciples have that, especially Peter. He's like, I'm not going to fall away, Lord. I am loyal. And they get to experience breaking loyalty, losing integrity, losing courage, these fundamental things that all people, and especially these men who have been following, who they believe to be the Son of God, they're going to fail. And Jesus says that in light of that failure, even then, don't let your heart be troubled. And now he's also talking about all of the pain, all the loss, the confusion that's about to ensue. Do not let your heart be troubled. Heart the core of who we are. Proverbs says to guard your heart because that's the wellspring of life right there. Everything that you are, everything you care about, all your desires, your will, everything flows from your heart. And so Jesus says that's, that's the source of the river of life that flows through you. And if you let that get poisoned, if the well gets poisoned, then your whole body is going to get poisoned. So guard against that. Don't let bitterness, fear, anger, resentment, worry, seep into your heart and poison you. And we have to continually bring back into focus the fact that he's saying this in light of the worst things that will ever happen in history. Even then, do not let your heart be troubled. You may suffer. Jesus sweat great drops of blood, but his heart remains steadfast in the Lord. We think of David, all the Psalms where David was just mourning and crying out before the Lord, and yet he so often came back to, and yet I just fall on my knees before you. I know that you're good. And so we can suffer, but let's guard our heart. So then I hear this, obviously, as a, just an a encouragement, a gentle encouragement. Don't let your hearts be troubled. After all this bad news, he's just tender. But I also hear a clear instruction. Do not let your heart be troubled implying that we can choose to let our heart be troubled in hard times or refuse to allow our heart to be troubled in hard times. It's a decision. The people who don't let their heart get troubled in hard times are not the, the dumb ones who just don't get the reality of the situation. If they're in Christ, then the ones who don't let their heart be troubled are the ones who get reality. Being realistic does not mean letting your heart be troubled. Being realistic means recognizing the higher reality that we live in in Christ. 
There is a higher reality. To be realistic as a Christian is to overflow with hope and joy and peace because God. So we can choose to not let our heart be troubled. We think, well, at least I, I, this is how my mind works oftentimes. Imagine like an open flame that gets really close to a dry piece of wood, and that dry piece of wood is going to catch on fire. It's primed and ready. It's, it's, all, it's the perfect storm. When trials come into my life and the heat gets turned up around me, I just, it's just natural that my heart is going to catch fire. I'm going to burn with anxiety and fear and worry and resentment and bitterness and anger and, and all these things. I'm going to burn with them. It's natural. Yes, it's natural, which is what Jesus saved us out of. Jesus came to give us a new nature. So while it may be natural to catch fire when our lives are, are heating up around us, in Christ, we have a second nature. And that doesn't mean that Jesus says you have to react perfectly the first time always. A second nature is something you develop over time. So we learn, we, we feel troubled like Jesus' disciples do, and then we recognize that we're letting our hearts be troubled, and then we get to make the choice. And what do we base the choice on? The second part of this verse, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Belief becomes the alternative to letting our hearts be troubled. It becomes our weapons and the wall that we place around us. We guard against fear, worry, anxiety, all that by believing in God. Nothing else in the world will be sufficient to keep ourselves truly from becoming troubled in our hearts. So, belief. This is our tool. What is it mean to believe? Like, oh, just don't, just don't let your heart be troubled. Just believe. Believe in God. Belief is this kind of vague, abstract kind of term. And I'm pretty much going to stay abstract, but I'll try and relate it to our human, like our, our kind of relational side, our social side. Belief in God, in a general way, is believing that He is everything He says He is, he does everything that he, he says that he has done, will do, and is doing. You're believing in everything that has ever been said by God about himself. Everything. You can't believe in God if you don't know the things you're supposed to be believing in. So, side note call, bury your mind in the Word. Think about him dwell on God and, and try to learn who He is. Jesus says this is eternal life, that they know you. Knowing God is eternal life. We can't believe in God unless we know who God is, who He says He is. So, some examples. Who is God? Deliverer, protector, provider, father, friend, counselor, teacher, instructor, guide, our strong tower, our defense, our shepherd, who leads us through the valley of the shadow of death so that we will fear no evil. God the Father sent the Son down to earth to live and die for us. And Paul says, if God sent his only begotten Son to die for our sins, to bring us back with him, how will he not willingly give us all things? What's more important than Jesus? And God gave us him. And Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Thousands of years earlier, God says to Joshua, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do we believe that? When we go through trials, are we letting our heart get troubled because we are forgetting our reality as Christians, or are we holding on to believing in God and in Jesus and finding courage to close off our hearts against that poison? It's not going to be perfect, but this is the general structure. Guard your heart. So Jesus gets even more specific now. Verse 2, it's specific in his encouragement. He says, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Here we go, one more time. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. There's a lot here. So Jesus is about to get crucified. He says, I'm going home. Jesus' death is not a loss. It's a homecoming for him. He says, I'm going through the trial. 
I'm going through the suffering. I'm going through death. And I'm coming out on the other side. And where am I going to be when I come out on the other side? I'm going to be home. Then, when I'm over there, I might kick back and relax for a minute, but probably not because I love you guys so darn much. I'm just going to set to work getting the place ready for you. Individually, he's preparing places for us in heaven. If God created the physical world, just in case anyone has these ridiculous notions of heaven, if God created the physical world and everything we see and touch and feel and smell and hear, who thinks that heaven is going to be some abstract, vague, naked babies floating around in the clouds thing? If, we, if God gave us the desire to have a home and if, to belong and to cultivate the ground and all this stuff, do you really think that the better place is going to be less concrete than this fallen and broken world? We have a very real home that we are all returning to. It will be a glorious homecoming. We will experience the belonging, the welcomeness, the acceptance like we have never experienced it before. And Jesus is preparing that place for us. So Jesus goes ahead of every single trial you will ever go through in your life, comes out on the other side, okay, makes the place ready, and then he will come back and walk with us through the trial. He was like, what have we to fear? Jesus says elsewhere, don't you guys worry that I'm leaving. I won't leave you as orph orphans. I will send the Holy Spirit, the helpmate. The Spirit of Jesus is what he's called in Acts, and he will walk with us through the trial. Lo and behold, Jesus did exactly as he said. He died. He traveled through the worst pain that any human being can ever experience, got to heaven, prepared our place so we have a place to look forward to, traveled back and by, through the Holy Spirit, and he is now not just outside some external force like paving the way and parting the sea distantly, but he is inside us, bearing us up. He's called the God of all comfort who comforts us in all affliction. He is inside each and every one of you inside us, helping us. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So, Jesus comes back, but he says he has a home for us. The presence of God is the only home that we have. We're not home yet. We're not home yet. In screw tape letters, there's this, this one C.S. Lewis writes it as this demon writing to another demon, teaching him how to, like, mentoring him to help tempt this guy, basically. And he says, we often wish long life on our victims because, basically, the more roots the person puts down on the world, the more roots the world puts back up in the person. And this can happen at any age. What happens when we start to see this fallen world like our home? What, do you, what is a home? A home is where you can let your hair down. It's the comfortable place. It's the safe place, the restful place where you can just be yourself, where you can relax, be refreshed, be built up. And if this world is our home, this is a horrible home. So what do you do when the home is horrible? What do you do when the HOA isn't getting on the people because they painted their house a horrible color of green and the dog is barking on into the night and there's trash in the yard? You complain because, darn it, I want to have a nice place here on earth. I want to be comfortable and, and safe and, and, and enjoy myself. Enjoying good things is an act of worship. It is. This whole passage is, is pretty intense. But enjoying good things is an act of worship. But when enjoying good things becomes our God, we've missed the boat. When comfort and safety and making this place into a little Eden becomes our priority, we've missed the boat. When we enjoy it in, proper, in its proper place, to the glory of God. It's worship. So don't just draw these hard, fast rules, but guard against making the enjoyment of good your God. We're not home yet. In Hebrews 11, Hebrews says that it, we call Hebrews 11 the hall of faith. It's like dozens of people who were recording all of these incredible acts that they do on earth by faith, with God's help, and it's recording the amazing ways in which they have suffered the incredible persecutions and pain and anguish that they underwent, also by faith. And it says that these all died not having received the promise. And that's what happens in life. We don't receive the full fulfillment of the promise in this life. 
You cannot receive the full promise without dying. The new covenant in Jesus' blood, a new covenant cannot be enacted without a death. The death comes before the fulfillment in Christ and in us and in the world. So there's this phrase, you're, no, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. And really, if you really get a clear picture of where you're going, you will be the most effective you can ever possibly be on this side of eternity. The reason Jesus was able to go to the cross and save every single one of us, Hebrews 12, 2, it says that Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of God in glory. Despising the shame, discounting it. It's nothing compared to the joy set before him. Paul says, I don't consider the sufferings that I, that I go through in this life anything compared to the eternal weight of glory that is prepared for me when I reach heaven. So Jesus, because he was looking to where he was going, that's why he was so effective here. As soon as we lose sight of that, our hearts become troubled and we become useless. We start to, to grumble and complain like the Israelites in the wilderness, forgetting that we're not home yet. We're supposed to be like soldiers, Paul writes in 2 Timothy, soldiers on active duty, athletes competing for the prize. When you live in a land of peace, like this place, your main concerns are like consumerism, basically, how you want to just enjoy yourself, and that's na it's natural. When you live in a war zone, a war-torn state, totally different. Your priorities completely change. We live in a war-torn world. Ephesians 6, the world is the battle zone. The world is the battlefield from Satan and his demons and God and his angels, and we are caught in the middle of it, and we have the armor of God and the sword of the spear, and we are commanded to stand firm and fight, to hold up the shield of faith. This is uncomfortable for me being a, a nice, comfy, middle-class American, but it's the truth. It's what we see in the gospel and in the word of God, and we can't hide from it. We are supposed to be soldiers here, not homeowners. This is not home. This is a war zone. And that's not, again, and yet we, we can fight against the darkness by enjoying the light. But that is a second or third or fourth priority compared to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Fight. There's so much to do here. So Jesus is gone. He's prepared a place for us. We're not home yet. We're on the journey. How do we get there? Verse 6, Jesus said to him, to him, to Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. For my whole life, pretty much the extent of what I've gotten out of this, this is a great verse, obviously, is there's only one God, there's only one mediator between God and man, that's Jesus Christ, and all these other religions are false, stay away from them. All of that is very true. But it only recently occurred to me that there is more here. We get to the Father through Jesus. What does it mean to go through Jesus? Jesus in each of the Gospels, and we read it in Matthew fairly recently, he says, if anyone wishes to become my disciple, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. So first of all, what does believing in Jesus mean? Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. What does believing in Jesus mean? You follow Jesus. What does following him look like? Walking around behind him with my hands shoved in my pockets while he carries the cross? Didn't he say that he would share our yoke? We are each supposed to carry our cross. And why are we carrying our cross? Because it's going like to it's gonna bulk me up, make me look good or it'll make me look holy or look like a martyr because it's about me carrying the cross, obviously. Maybe it's going to make us look like criminals to the world. Maybe it's going to make us look wrong and bad and evil. But none of that even matters. We're carrying our cross because of where we're carrying it to. This is not, to, to make a sort of bad pun, this is not crossfit. This is crucifixion. This is a real deal. We climb Golgotha with Jesus. We follow him. And what happens when we get to the top? Do we just throw our cross aside and be like, whew, 
that was crazy. I'm just going to towel off, get some Gatorade, snap a picture, a selfie, and post it on Facebook and be like, oh, I just finished my first 5K crosswalk. I'm really proud. This was an achievement for me. And everyone's clapping me on the back like, yeah, you go, man. And when you do the 5Ks and the marathons, which are great in and of themselves, but you're going through streets lined with people, yeah, you're so great. I could never do that. You're amazing. Yeah. And Hebrews says that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses cheering us on. Sure, that's, that's there, but we can't see that, can we? What we see is the world around us. And what was the victory tunnel for Jesus? It was the exact opposite. It was the people that he loved and that he came to save, and, that, and some who even welcomed him into the city, reviling him, shouting at him, spitting on him, hating him, abusing him. He went through the exact opposite of what we are used to going through as nicely individuated, hardworking citizens. He was treated as a criminal the whole way up, and then when he got there, he died. He was murdered, executed as a criminal on the cross. We don't just go the journey and then kind of, okay, throw off the cross. That was, that was cool. I already believe in Jesus, so I'm good. Believing in Jesus means following Jesus. Following Jesus means following him Picking up your cross and following. Picking up your cross and following Jesus means following him to the top of the hill, and that means laying down on your cross and letting the nails be driven into your hands and feet and being crucified with Christ. Now, this is not a works theology. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid once for all for our sin. Jesus perfectly covered over everything we deserved from God. He took the wrath of God on himself, meaning... He, he did, you know, the operation game. He removed the judgment. So now, what's left in death when the judgment is removed? Resurrection. All we have to look forward to when we die is the next, even better life. So we follow Jesus up to the cross to get to the joy set before us. You cannot get to the resurrection without the crucifixion. By nature, by, by definition, resurrection requires a death. You have to die to be brought back to life. And when you're brought back to life, it's not just a re restoration of the old life. It's a new creation. We even see this in, in Jesus. And after he rose from the dead, he, was, he had a glorified body. He could walk through walls. We're gonna, and this, is, this is literal. This is not metaphorical. We have an even better life on the other side of our death. And I'm not just talking about the once-for-all physical death, you die, you move on. I'm talking about Jesus says, pick up your cross every day. We die with Christ, and when we die with Christ, that one time, our sin is removed. The judgment is removed off of us. Then we're given a new nature, and what is the rest of our life spent doing? Learning to walk according to that new nature. Developing a second nature in total freedom. And how do we do that? By dying. Why? Because our old nature is still here. We have to kill it every day. Our pride, our self-concern, our, our lust and greed and anger and hunger for comfort, our, our appetites that we just let run rampant, everything in us needs to die every day. We need to keep following Jesus. Jesus says, if you lose your life. If you try and save your life, you're going to lose it. If you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. When a death occurs, you lose what you had. Death in a family, death of a friend, death of a pet, death of a career, death of a plan, a dream, a project, of a relationship, anything. You lose what you had. What comes on the other side? The ultimate mystery, the ultimate unknown is when we physically die. And what really, experientially, we have no idea what comes on the other side. When, when a part of my life dies, that's the time when I've lost it. I haven't lost a part of my life until it dies. Because as long as it's alive, I could call it back. I could interact with it. But once it's dead, there's no life in it. That's how you lose something. So the way to lose your life for Jesus' sake is to die to those things in you and to reckon yourself, to consider yourself dead to those things. And what comes on the other side of that death? New life. New life. 
Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Believe that I have gone to the other side and that there is resurrection on the other side. This is part of how we do not let our hearts be troubled is believing that the resurrection comes after the crucifixion. Not a minute sooner, but it's there. It's always there. This is a kingdom law. Outside of the kingdom of God, this is not true. Naturally speaking, you die, that's it. But in the kingdom of God, it's a new law of nature. Death means greater life. Let's flip real quick to John 16. And before we read this, uh, a note totally random side note for probably where your minds are tracking, but a note for anyone who struggles with suicide or self-harm, because this is very important. Satan will gladly use scripture and, and use that to convince you to sin. And all of this talk about death and death as, as our tool to, to get more life, if Satan tries to use this to convince you that death is the way to God, rebuke him in Jesus' name and live, because Jesus doesn't say the way to God is through death. He says the way to God is through Jesus, and we go through the death of Jesus. And we only experience a death that leads to life when our death is in Jesus, following Jesus. By that same logic, if I were to say, oh, death, yes, death will release me, so I will like cut myself and I will take my own life, that's like me saying, okay, so in order to experience a better marriage, I need to get divorced from Andy. In order to, to, to experience fatherhood, I need to send my children away. In order to experience a career, I need to kill my career. I need to burn my house down. That's absurd. Death itself is nothing. Jesus redeems death, and only in Jesus will death lead to life. So if you've got any of those stupid lies, just swat them away, because Satan's a loser, and that's not true. All right, John 16, 20. Jesus is still talking about his crucifixion. We're getting close to be done. Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. There's a huge truth in here, and it goes all the way back to Genesis, to the fall. When we sinned against God, decided that we were going to be our own masters, we we were going to call the shots, we became cursed. We brought it on ourselves. One part of the curse was that the woman in labor would experience, her pain in childbearing, childbirth would be multiplied, excessive pain. That moment, at the beginning of of the fall. That moment was prophetically looking forward to Jesus Christ, who suffered the most excruciating pain anyone will suffer, anguish on on every level in order to bring new life into the world. Every single time someone goes through this process, the process of labor and experiences the curse, that is a merest glimpse of what Jesus experienced to give us new life. Now, to apply that to ourselves, if we prioritize avoiding pain in our lives, if we pray to God, just get this, get this cup, let it, like, get it far away from me, and he doesn't answer, and we say, fine, I'll run away, or I'll deal with it myself, and we prioritize avoiding pain, prioritize avoiding discomfort, we prioritize avoiding joy, deep, fulfilling joy, and We prioritize allowing new life to come into our life, new life, to experience it, to bring it into the world. If we try to run from the pain and the suffering, we're running from the very life that God has to offer us. So again, this is not some masochistic like, oh, I just need to seek out suffering because that's the way. Jesus didn't seek out the crucifixion. He He did all things in God's timing. He accepted it when it came. And he did not let his heart be troubled because he believed in God. He believed that on the other side of the resurrection, on the other side of the crucifixion was the resurrection. On the other side of the birth pangs was new life for all of humanity. The joy set before him was better. And Jesus even says here that when the pain, when the when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been brought into the world. 
He says that when one sinner repents, there's great rejoicing in heaven. And when we get to heaven, Revelation says, John says in Revelation, tears are going to be wiped away, the anxiety is going to be taken away, the depression is going to be taken away, the pain, the suffering, the struggles, and the memory of them. Not because God's going to turn us into robots, but because we're going to be so overcome with our home, the first home and the only home we have ever had. We're going to be so overcome with how magnificent it is that we're going to forget all of the previous pain. Uh, We can have the band come up. So, I just want to read one more verse real quick. I'm not going to talk on it. But Jesus is in the midst of the worst hours in human history. He's going to experience everything. Anything you ever experienced, Jesus has experienced it. He's gone through it. He has overcome it. And he has come back in his spirit to walk with you through that. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Jesus is our shepherd. He will never leave you or forsake you. Belief pushes against letting your heart be troubled, and we know where we're going, and we keep that perspective. Now, real quick, John 16, 33. Jesus says at the end of all this, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Let's pray.